If it is Tuesday, that could mean only one thing, that you and me are here tonight together at Comic Book School Live. It is January 31st, the year 2023, and a big year it has been. We've been covering all different types of creative techniques, and tonight we have a very special show, which is very practical for you, packed with example. I only have one example. Um, and also packed with good chocolatey fun. And speaking of a warm chocolatey center, please welcome <laughs> my, I have a fuzzy thing, my co-host and good buddy, Mike, three-time Emmy award-winning television writer, Fuss Solo. Hi, bud. That was good, huh? Yeah, that was very good. I was a little worried at the beginning because you didn't immediately jump into the new opening. Yeah, well, I'm kind of, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I feel like I, we're in this almost two years. I'm rusty all the time. Yes, well, you know, it happens. So, Mike, we, I just want to review for the, for the, uh, for the fan uh, that watches the show. <laughs> this year, we've had a couple of big shows. So, uh, we started off with how to 2023, right in January, how to start off with a successful year. Uh, we moved immediately into how to document your goals. We gave examples and even brought a monkey in with a typewriter to show you how to do it. We showed you how to use a thing called a calendar. This is an episode where you weren't able to join us, Mike. We had uh, Joe Illage join us, uh, editor from Heavy Metal. Okay. How'd he do? Was he good? He did really well, particularly well since we sent him a proposal for heavy metal uh, <laughs> a day later. So he was uh, absolutely the best. He was fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> he could have been terrible. We were like, you're the best. <laughs> true that, though. True that. We did send Joe a proposal for heavy metal, <clears throat> proof that we are creative uh, uh, writers ourselves. And then just last week, Mike, I uh, gave you the... Uh, the week off, we talked about motion graphics comics for your Kickstarter campaign. Uh, kind of cool, right? Yeah, yeah. And Vince is the guy who did the opening credits. Vince is the guy. Uh, tonight, though, Mike, uh, we have a, a special episode, but we also have a weird stunt. So first, I'll just tease you. We're going to be doing defining character conflicts. Uh, but first, Mike, do you do you like your teeth? Uh, they're all right. I think they're a little yellow right now. I need them. I need them whitened. Well, I'm glad that you brought that up because tonight I brought a toothbrush fresh <laughs> in the package. Now, what, what does toothpaste generally look like, Mike? It looks like white paste. Yeah. White paste. Now, sometimes you can get the stuff that, and it has, it's blue, right? Oh, they are blue. Yes. There's okay. pink. They have yeah, blue. Mostly white. Tonight, Mike, we're going to be doing something special. Oh, boy. I didn't bring a toothbrush. I brought one for me, and you may not want to do, participate. By the end of the show, we are going to um, try... Oh, yes. Charcoal <laughs> mint. I have, uh, I have done the charcoal. So this showed up in my uh, medicine cabinet. I just want to show the viewers. It is black. It's black. So uh, at the end of the show, if people stick around... Uh, I will show you just how painfully awkward it looks when you blush, brush your teeth with black toothbrush. Now, who thought people want to whiten their teeth? You know what they need? Black toothbrush. Yep. yep. So yep, for the yep. group, I am going to set this over here on the side, Mike. And uh, I will brush my uh, pearly whites, which may not be pearly white at the end of this. They absolutely will not be. They will be awkward. And Glenn, a toothpaste beard, been there, done that. Evil dead toothpaste. Yeah, it, it is like evil dead toothpaste. Uh, speaking of, I just want to note, uh, Glenn said beard. I've been wearing your Christmas gift to me this year, Mike. I have been wearing this now for uh, close to two weeks. <laughs> Can you tell? Maybe, maybe you should try the tooth the toothpaste on there, darken things up a bit. I got to tell you, it's a little bit of a it's a little bit of a disappointment, isn't it? Two weeks. Two. Wow, that's that's uh, that's not good. I tried so hard to give you a gift that you would you would use well, and apparently you haven't. No, but you know what gift you did give well, Mike? The What's gift that? of storytelling. Let's uh, let's get started with defining character conflicts. Do you know who these two characters are, Mike? Uh, I do. That is Doctor Doom and Reed Richards, Mister Fantastic. 
who would name themselves Mr. Fantastic? Um, what kind of okay. ego would you have? Well, you know, he can stretch. But he, can you imagine naming yourself like, what do you want to be? I'll be the thing. I'll be the torch. She, Sue Richards like, oh, I just turned invisible. I'm the invisible woman. Reed Richards like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm Mr. Fantastic. Can you imagine? And I bet they were all upset that they didn't think of cool names like that for themselves. Or they were like, yeah, yeah, we're in, we're in. We're... What? <laughs> they were all like, he's not going to. He's not going to stick with it. And then he was like, and we'll call ourselves the Fantastic Four. Yeah, well, and look what happened. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. I, uh, I was, always, uh, was always interested in the psychology of that. So defining character conflict. So, Mike, here's what we're going to do. We're going to talk tonight a little bit about how to define character conflicts for your comic book store. You... You do a lot of character conflict uh, planning when you're writing uh, one of your very many television and cinema things. Am I right? I have I have done some here and there on occasion. Yes. All right. So let's get started. When I said character conflict, you said Batman and Joker. All right. So what what is a character conflict between these two characters? What uh, what do we know about these two characters that put them into conflict? Well, obviously, Batman's a good guy. Fights for the, the rights of the people. Uh, Joker's a bad guy, goes around doing bad things, robbing banks, killing people. So they are in conflict right there because Batman wants to stop him and Joker wants to keep doing his thing. That's right. And the conflict, which has been defined for many decades uh, since before we were born, um, helps us to understand why these two characters are in perpetual conflict, but understanding who your characters are and what their conflicts are, are really important for propelling your story, right? Yes. So one of the things that um, uh, I was telling you about and I was working on, and I'll, I'll, um, I'll get back to this, um, I was working on a story. Uh, it is a crime story. We're not going to name it because I actually picked, pitched it to a real editor who rejected it. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> <laughs> that should make everybody feel better that no matter how long you're in this business, you still get rejected. Right, Mike? Oh, yes. All the time. Yep. So I wept, licked <laughs> my wounds, and got right back on. And, and the editor was kind enough to give me a rather detailed breakdown of uh, what he didn't like about my story. That's always a good thing. It's always a good thing. And he was critical of two areas. One was uh, the strength of the characters uh, and the strength of the story, which pretty much was everything. Yeah. So <laughs> page one rewrite. <laughs> <laughs> Too long, did not read. So... <laughs> When he did write it up, he was kind enough, and this is this is not common in comics to send a cold pitch, not fully cold. I had contacted him before. Actually, going back, Mike, I met him at New York Comic Con. I got his contact information. I followed up with him. I did what I recommend that everyone else does. I sent a picture of myself saying we met. Was it a was it a good picture? <laughs> It was a good picture. It was, I was get, coming out of the shower, had a three quarter turn. <laughs> Hair slicked back. <laughs> I looked pretty good. And uh, he was like, ah, I don't remember that. This is awkward. <laughs> no, I actually took a picture um, that of me at the con and I sent it to the editor and said, if you recall, uh, we spoke and he said, I don't recall. <laughs> I met a lot of people, but. Uh, I kind of alluded to my story, says, I would be happy to read your pitch. So I took a little time. I built the pitch. And I can tell you the genre was crime. Mm -hmm. And I was very excited about it. I worked on it. I shared it with you. You said it was pretty good, right? I enjoyed it, yes. I thought it was yeah. pretty good. Apparently, it wasn't very good. Apparently, neither of us know what we're doing. <laughs> so uh, I did take his note seriously, and I was trying to work through, Mike, what was going wrong with the story. And I realized that I had not really done my full homework 
in mapping out how the characters were in conflict, which would lead to when they do intersect, pushing the plot forward, escalating, and then finally coming to a final confrontation. Okay. Right. I, I didn't do my homework well. So if you've uh, ever been to my house, and most of you haven't, but Mike has been, <laughs> you will know that there is a, oh, did I show it? Okay. Okay. I blocked out some stuff. Uh, there is an entire wall in my basement. You can see here in the far corner, that's a light switch. And that is a banister. So there's a wall floor to ceiling that I painted as whiteboard uh, paint. And this is a dry erase wall, essentially. I know uh, where that is. You do know where that is. Right over here, this was uh, this used to be the doorbell. They, they took it out. Uh, so I still have to paint over it. I'm going to do is sand over. It'll be the third time I've painted this wall. <laughs> <clears throat> I cannot tell you how useful it is to have an entire wall on which to be able to just draw with markers. And, and I only used a few colors, um, but I bought every color that you can possibly get because I love my colors. And I use the colors to color code things. You, it's a little washed out here. You can't see it. Uh, these arrows here, these are purple. Uh, this arrow is also purple. There's an orange one here. So here's what I'm gonna do. So now that we've seen the zoom out, I'm gonna zoom in. So what I did, Mike, was I started off mapping my characters. I put the the three main characters. It is a it's an ensemble crime story, and I've got the three main characters. And then underneath them, I put a line indicating that they are a major character. And then I put what do they want? And I just put in no particular order. In this case, L wants safety for his brother. A wants women. Good, good one. F wants accolades, right? Like they all have their motivations, but for each character minimum, I put three wants. Like what is their motivation? Everybody's motivated by more than one thing and what propels their actions and then how they react later is generally determined by what they want. Right, Mike? Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Right. So here are the main characters. Now, one of the things I wanted to do is the first character that I put in over here was their main foil, uh, who I put down as MD, and he wants to maintain and hold and blackmail. Okay. So there are um, really basic needs that we have. MD wants to maintain and hold what he has and is willing to. Uh, blackmail people. So we know that he has some characteristics that are generally considered unsavory and villainous. Over here to the right, just above, B is related to MD. So B and MD are related to each other. Uh, so they are still above and in red. I put them in red because they're villains. It helps me to keep track of it. All right. Okay. So L, A, and F, right here in the middle of the, the main ones. In red, you have M and D and B. Over here, you have police detective, and he wants a big collar and a catch. And I just noted. Like a big B. collar? He wants to collar. <laughs> he, wants, <laughs> he wants a collar. So he wants the big, the big collar here, and he wants to catch M, D in the act. Okay? And yeah. he also knows that the way to get to MD is through B. So you can see the arrow from green, he's the good guy, to the B, and then the B is the way to the MD. So, so far we've started to create this constellation. Who are these people? Over here, you can see what happens is B is motivated, and when the crime begins, he does something unexpected. He sends the crime to this character P who then outsources it to T and L. So what happens is, is everybody has a job. You have one simple job you're supposed to do, but everybody makes little mistakes that they think will not matter. But what we see is that these do matter. Are we tracking so far? Never outsource your jobs. Never outsource your job. So I'm going to go back real quick. Now, if you recall from the big one, you can see here, we have S, which is a dashed line. This is a minor character. Um, and the, the, the two arrows here for me represented 
that essentially uh, this character S is a minor character, but is an informant to the police detective that tips him off that something is going on with this crime. Um, I did consult a an actual real life detective. Mm. Uh, a good friend of ours is a detective. Hold on, let me see. So it's your story outline in front of you, large and in your face. It it, it is Glenn, and Glenn's right, Mike. Um, it is not just the story; uh, it's the characters, but it is the story. And so Glenn is right. You can see little tips of what's going on. So let me just point out what those are, because Glenn is absolutely correct. So. Um, he's going to get a radio call, what's called a 311 in New York. You know what a 311 is? Uh, 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 I'm going to guess a robbery. I wouldn't have even guessed that well. So a 911 is a true emergency. A 311 is you are calling the police to report there's a loud noise. I don't know what it is, right? It's, it's not <laughs> yeah. an emergency. You know, it's, 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 uh, Glenn just said it's a band from Iowa. That's, that's better guess. Yes. Better guess. But a 311, he showed me, is that the police are constantly monitoring what is going on in their precinct. And a 311 is just information that's flashing up or being, uh, set over the radio. And that just gives them some insight. So if you're there, and you hear a 311, it's not an emergency, not shots fired, not, you know, uh, houses burning down, but something is happening. As he noted, you know, you could be writing a ticket, you hear 311, you lodge it in the back of your mind, you continue what's going on. But if you see something and you go, oh, that's odd, and it just came across the radio. So what's happened is he hears this 311 and he asks this character what's going on. He says, I can't tell you much, but I do know that this character F is involved with something. So police detective knows F. And he also knows a little bit about the potential people who are involved. So we start drawing the lines. And as Glenn, as Glenn Gatilla just noted, we start to now see what happens when this propel, when we see the plot begin. Main character, the main villain MD is away. He's on a long weekend. He's involved with somebody else over here. So he has a tapestry. He's got a rich background. And what we have here is a plot that's intertwined. I'm going to show, I'm going to zoom in one more time now, Mike. Are you tracking so far? I'm tracking so far, yes. Now, what I, one more thing I like to do um, is you notice that I put a green line here and then an arrow. Yeah, I was just going to ask you about that. So in the final version, so I do take this and I... Um, I took a picture of it, I imported it into my computer, and then in PowerPoint, I remake this, and I move the things around. And what I wanted to do was a scale of good to bad. So I draw a line from a, right about here where my mouse is, and I put characters that are generally good, characters that are on the line, and then characters that are um, potentially villainous. So character F won accolades, and I moved him over to the far left so he would be closer to the criminals. And then I took L and A. They're generally good guys who got involved in something that they're in over their head. So I would move them over to the right. So in the final version, Mike, what I did was I created this ecosystem, this map of who everybody is to each other and what motivates them. Hence, propelling the story and then giving the plot a level of depth that allows me to say, how would this character react in this relationship? So I'm going to pause here for a second and get your thoughts. Uh, do you follow a similar process? Do you plot out like this? How do you do it? I have been, try I usually don't do the the lines and all that like, like you did. I usually just do bullet points of, you know, and write out quickly, this one conflicts with this one because, you know, of whatever. But yeah, I don't do the, the lines and the, the boxes and all that. See, when, and, and the reason I did the lines in the boxes, so for example, I did not realize that when I was here, um, I needed this S character. I just didn't realize it. I actually had to walk up a step here. You can see here's the banister. I had to walk up and <laughs> right up that high because you know me. I'm, I'm of diminutive height. So when I realized that, I knew that I had to put this extra character S in here and then give that character a little bit of background but I know that that's a minor character. He's he's 
one of the few archetypes that are just there to give a reason for this character to then react in a way that's appropriate to um, his work as a police detective. He's a good police detective. He's far to the right in green. He is on the side of law and order. He's an honest cop. That's why he's so far over. And what I do is I use proximity and distance to show the difference between these characters. Now, what's that, what's that yellow line next to the purple one? Coming off a of B. Um, that was a fluorescent color orange that didn't show up when I tried to photograph it, so I drew purple. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Um, the purple lines over here are uh, indicative of characters uh, that are there um, for some uh, comic relief. Um, I wanted to have a little bit of comic relief. I wanted most of this to be serious, um, but the characters over here uh, the P, the T, and the L are there just for some light comic relief because I just felt like, okay, you've got a serious crime story. There's going to be a lot of killing. And I just thought, oh, yeah, there you go. That's just my OCD. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. That's right. Uh, Christian's absolutely right. My OCD is legendary. Having this wall this dirty uh, makes me insane, Mike. Do you um, flinch a little when you walk by it every night? I do. Actually, when my wife walked by it, <clears throat> when Janet walked by it, she almost brushed her arm against it. I like practically hip checked her. <laughs> she was walking down the steps. No. Don't rub your arm on that. So I took a picture of it. Um, so, yes, my OCD means that I had to photograph this. But, Mike, um, as we start to think about this, um, in uh, future episodes, what we're going to be doing is looking at some of the different software that you can use for mind mapping. As I noted, um, I move this into PowerPoint simply because I, uh, I have it, I use it every day, uh, and I'm pretty quick with it. But there are other types of software uh, that can aid writers in their writing. I know you use, uh, what do you use, Final Draft? Uh, Final Draft for the, the script, yeah. That's... Does it do anything else like outlining and... You can, you can, yeah, you can make notes. You can uh, break it up to be like um, a collaboration. You can, you can put it online, so or you can do like the collaboration writing. So you can just go back and forth with your partners and stuff. Is that when you send me a final draft thing or one of those what uh, Microsoft? Uh, what is it? What is Microsoft Word thing you always send me? And I can't pages. 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 <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is actually in final draft. But yeah, it's it's got some good stuff. You know, people complain a lot about it, but everybody uses it and it does what it needs to do. So it works, works fine for me. People complain about me all the time and I do what I have to do. Yeah, so. that's all you got to do. Mac has a new built-in mind map software called Freeform. Oh, yes, cool. that's right. I haven't checked it out too much, but it is on, um, it's the new Mac stuff, but you wouldn't know about that. I would not know about that. Actually, Janet uh, has a has a Mac, so I might check it out on her. Yeah, it's called Freeform. It's it's you know it's basically like what you did on your on your board. And what then uh, I use Scrivener. Uh, Christian um, is uh, is noting that I I use Scrivener. Uh, it, it's a really good tool for breaking out chapters when you're writing a large project. So I've been uh, for the past hundred or so years, I've been working on a book. <laughs> and I've been putting it into, so I, I'm great with the software. I mean, I'm just not great at publishing the book. You should write a book on how to use the software. On how to not finish things. <laughs> um, anyway, I use Scrivener, you use Final Draft. We'll look into that um, mind map tool called Freeform. Yeah. Uh, we have about five minutes, uh, Mike, before we go to Black Toothpaste. Uh, and people can see if this was a huge mistake. Um, <laughs> but we also have a, a very special uh, feature in the show uh, that, oh, wait, let's uh, let's pull this up. So real quick, Mike, um, I'm going to ask you, how do you create conflict between characters other than using different colored magic markers? Uh, you mean like in my head? In your head. Yeah, you just got to, you got to find pretty much the opposite of of the characters like <laughs> like batman and joker are both good or a good guy and a bad guy you just have to find what you know is in your good guy's head and kind of make that the opposite for the bad guy so there are always constant conflict they're not like oh i can 
see where he's coming from. It's got to be, you know, they always have to butt heads. And I think that sometimes when you look at uh, Mr. Fantastic <laughs> and Dr. Doom, there, there's also a benefit sometimes to looking at characters that are so amazingly similar. They're both genius scientists in this case. But when uh, in the origin story of Dr. Doom, um, he was off by a single calculation, right? And then, oh, hold on, there's a, jokes about one's mother or they go to work wearing the same thing. Gl yeah, Glenn. Yeah, Glenn the, the wearing the same thing can really cause trouble. <laughs> yeah. Who wore it better? <laughs> um, but I find that trying to figure out not just what makes them different, Mike, but what makes them similar. Like, what do they have in common that creates the conflict? I don't think that there are too many people who are black and white opposites. I think what you have sometimes are people who are similar enough to want the same thing. In my crime story, everybody wants the same thing, uh, but it could be just a small tilt to the left or to the right, which makes them different, hence the conflict. And just how, how they go about wanting to get that. How they go about wanting to get it, right. They're on a trajectory. They want the same thing, but it is that little difference in their personality that makes them in conflict. And of yeah. course, just wanting the same thing, right? <clears throat> Neither of them want to be uh, compromised. Yeah. So I think honest, honestly, betrayal seems to work pretty good. Yeah, betrayal is a good conflict motivator it'll drive somebody to feel like they want to go get revenge so i think that's a that's a great point uh by glenn but mike this is uh time for um you want to play the theme music i play that theme music mike's trivia time Woo -hoo! um so mike yeah. you uh you I think we got to change it to trivia because it's not really trivia but i guess it could be trivia um, well, Mike, what you do every week is invaluable to our writing community <laughs> because you bring them a droplet of knowledge uh, through trivia that helps them to have a, have a great idea. So today, this is the second one uh, that you've done that involves a bug. Yes, yes. Um, I thought of this one because I was, I was thinking about cool things that you could add to a book or a story um, for like poisons. And things like that, too. You know, if you want to torture people. But a Spanish well, fly, Mike? I don't Spanish know. Fly. First torture of all, people with the Spanish well, fly? Well, yeah. First of all, it's it's not from a fly um, or anything that has to do with Spain. Uh, it is from a beetle uh, called the blister beetle. And uh, what happens is it has this, uh, this substance in it called uh, cantharidin. What and, is it? Yeah. It, what? What's it called? Yeah, what's it called? Wait, can what is can it? Cantharidin. Cantharidin. Yeah, din. All right, let me pull up that link that you gave me. Cantharidin. Okay. So this is this is where you meticulously research this. Yes, meticulously within the last five minutes before the show went on the air. <laughs> but it does involve a bug of some sort. It does involve a beetle, and it's just you know this one secretion from this beetle. Um, but it says it's an aphrodisiac, Mike. Well, that's what you all know as uh, what Spanish fly is from, but I'm going I'm to get to that because the, the substance, um, if you put it on your skin, will create just amazingly painful blisters. So, you yeah. know, just say if you wanted to torture somebody, you could just rub some of this on them. But if you ingest it, just a tiny amount, it's going to eat away your stomach and cause abdom your abdominal cavity to fill with blood and just, you know, it'll start eating away everything inside. Now here, here is where the, uh, the um, aphrodisiac part comes in because uh, it also kicks off uh, inflammation in you, which tends to engorge external organs. <laughs> and we all know what that is. So that's where the, right. the, the myth comes in about, you know, you know, it being an aphrodisiac. But is it a myth, Mike, or is it true? It's, they they have done some tests and stuff by taking it, you know, in extremely, extremely small amounts and, and doing things with it. But it really, you know, the Spanish fly, be, or not the beetle, but the, the beetle and its substances is just not good at all. No, yeah, uh, Christian, wanted to, Christian wanted to 
say that there was a torture, but it, I guess it depends on what yes. sort of torture it so is. Like, if you, yeah, if you're if you're writing a book or a movie or a, a screenplay or whatever, and you want to really torture somebody, this I hear is one of the absolute worst tortures because you know who wants to have their their abdominal cavity filled with blood? Wow. Yeah, it's bad. Bad news, bud. <sighs> What is that? Holy yes. Cleopasm Batman. <laughs> yeah. Glenn, yeah. Glenn, I, uh, I'm going to have to Google that. I'm not sure what that is. <laughs> and then uh, test on who? Uh, Marianne, Marianne just volunteered. Yeah. Uh, just, just a little bit. Just a just, tiny bit. I, that, those are hand raises, right? Those she, <laughs> isn't that what the kids do to, raise, to show they're raising their hands? They're volunteering? So uh, I love that our community is deeply involved. They really came alive when you started talking about aphrodisiacs, Mike. Yeah, and well, torture. You know, everybody loves it. Aphrodisiac torture, you know? Yeah. If so you're into Marianne, that sort of thing. Miriam's backing out now. It's too late. She's already signed up. <laughs> she, she signed up. So, But she doesn't mean she has to take it. She's just going to. She just has to be there to see it. See, yes. Like, she might have some. Uh, some conflicts right <laughs> that she wants to solve through this evil beetle so mike thank you so much for uh for bringing your your awesome thing uh painful prolonged torture christian's just still on torture i mean he's yeah. that's he's all all torture all the time <laughs> the facebook user says worst ways to, worst ways to go hashtag not really no no it's it's bad bad news i think he was talking about the priapism <laughs> Or whoever it was. I would suspect it was a he. That Facebook user. That Facebook user getting all quirky on us. So, um, well, that was good, Mike. Yeah. That Thanks. was good. You, you did good. So let me just see. Where are we? So, Mike, we will put this um, and uh, the uh, link in our show notes, as we always do. Um, what do we have next? Oh, that's it. That's, that's the end of that. So... <laughs> Good. Better. So, Mike, what do you think will happen? I'm going to now, uh, for the team, take one for the team. So, for those of you who joined late, shame on you. Um, this is, um, this showed up in my drawer. It's called Charcoal Mint. Now, this showed up and I thought, oh, this is artisanal. You know, like you look at like the size, right? So, I probably, my, we probably paid twice as much for a tube that was <laughs> Half a small, but you see this one. This one has no chrome collar, but this one has a has a chrome collar, right? Looks nice, fancy. So, so I opened it up, and I was dismayed to find that this toothpaste is indeed black. What do you think is going to happen when I brush my teeth with this? Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that it's going to turn your teeth black. Now, why would somebody say, you know what? I got an idea. People want teeth whitening. Why don't we make black toothpaste? Well, because everybody likes it, like in the character conflicts, everybody likes the opposite. And the thing with it, with charcoal, is that it is a, a cleaner. It's black. So, yeah, it's it's a cleaner. It's actually black. Yeah, like so, so if you have, if you have, uh, you know, when they, if you have issues with your tum tum, they sometimes give you charcoal. All right, Mike. So I do this for the comic book school. You think I should do it? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Do you think this will cause cancer in a few years? Uh, I don't think so, but you know, it could cause some issues with the. I feel like teeth. I feel like I'm going to brush my teeth with this, and the Crest Company is going to be like, "Oh no, that was totally a gag. <laughs> you weren't supposed to actually use it." Oh, it's get it was it's for April Fool's Day. All right, so here we go, Mike. So you you want to do teeth brushing music for me? Okay, you ready? Go ahead. Brush, 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 brush teeth. Teeth, teeth, teeth. <laughs> how, does that, how does that look? That's, that's good. You gotta, I gotta really get the lather going though. Okay, okay. Hold on, I think I need a little bit more. Oh boy, this is artisanal. You need a little bit, a little bit of liquid in there to, to really foam it up. Brush, 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 brush teeth, brush, brush. That's they must use that for the zombies in TV shows. Yeah, they give them yeah. just a little bit. Marianne, Marianne said, "Don't do it." A little too late. Corpse fruit. Mm. Corpse fruit. Corpse fruit. Mm. I don't know what that is. I don't know either. Hold on. Let's, let me just make myself real big here. Oh, that's nice. Yeah? Nice. So, I didn't just leave it like this. 
Yes, I'm sure Janet would appreciate. <laughs> she bought it for me. <laughs> so anyway, Mike, um, thanks everybody for coming to see us here on Comic Book School Live. Uh, we'll see you again next week. Next week, we have a very special guest. Mike, you know who you have? I do not. Brian Michael Bendis. Oh, nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. All right, guys. So thanks for everything. Um, yeah, we'll see you next week. And uh, uh, keep making comics.